Ah, a bear in his natural habitat, a Studebaker. Kermit and Fozzie's car from the original Muppet movie is about to undergo a makeover, says Kyle Sater, the curator of the Studebaker Museum. That's because the car's a 1951 Studebaker Commander. You know, it's, it's neat to have as is, but we'd love to kind of get it back to what it looked like in the movie. And it was a father and son who donated it to the museum, uh, I think in 2004. So we've had it for going on, you know, 15, 20 years. So it is a 1951 Studebaker Commander. Um, you, can, you can see it's, it's seen better days, right? Um, but it is the original car that was, that was in the movie, used in the movie. This car required major modifications in order to create the illusion of the Muppets driving the car. So there would be somebody operating it from the trunk. There is a steering wheel um, set up and the person would be crouched back in the trunk and a camera set inside this sort of bullet nose um, in the front, allowing them to see where they were going via like a small uh, monitor in the trunk. About 15 years ago, a father and son donated this iconic car to the Studebaker Museum. Before then, it had been sitting in a back lot exposed to the elements, which caused sun damage and washed off much of the paint. It's, it's been around, it's, it's you know, had some weathering, some damage done to it. Um, we're trying to raise $175,000 to bring the car back up to the as sort of seen on screen condition um, and also get it operable. A replica Fozzie Bear is being made by a professional puppet maker. It is estimated that it will take one to two years in order for the car to be restored and operational. For TBH, I'm Andrew Messicar. Living in the Michiana area gives us the unique advantage to be able to experience a wide range of landscapes within a short distance from each other. Within just a few minutes, you can go from the city to farmland and even the lakeshore. In fact, just a few years ago, our biggest lakeshore, the Indiana Dunes, became a national park. As Daniel Rodriguez tells us, there's a lot more to the dunes than warm weather and beaches. When most people think about the Indiana Dunes National Park, they probably picture giant sand mountains and water. However, a 60-mile long park actually has many different habitats, such as woodland areas. That's where I visited the Spring Maple Syrup Festival. Uh, welcome to Maple Sugar Time at Shellburg Farm, part of the Indiana Dunes National Park. Bruce Rowe, a public information officer with the National Park, says that it's the perfect time to tap trees. Every tree has some sugar in its sap. This time of year, as the sap is starting to be drawn up for spring to get that energy out into the branches to open the buds into leaves, that's when it has the highest sugar content. One of the unique things about the Dunes Maple Syrup Festival is that the park rangers demonstrate the different ways maple syrup has been made throughout the centuries, starting with the Native Americans. And it would have just been real good as far as the calories and such. Plus, it's like almost like money. Um, they could trade that. Native Americans then taught settlers how to make the syrup. The settlers then developed new techniques to make maple sugar. As you can see, it looks mostly like water, because it mostly is. It's 98% uh, water at this point. At the end of the trail, visitors get a first-hand look inside the sugar shack. That's where the maple syrup was harvested by the Schulberg family into the 1930s. It takes a tree of 10 inches in diameter to tap. It takes 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. Pull down on the pail, make sure it doesn't fall out. All right. Okay. Rose says attendance at the park has been up. While nearly 200,000 people visited the farm every year, 
The entire National Dunes Park broke a new record last year, welcoming more than 3 million visitors. He says that's why events like this one are important. I think this festival shows us a little bit about our history, where maple syrup comes from, but also how even in small ways like maple syrup, our lives are connected to the land. That's one of the most important things we try and get across to folks in the National Park Service. Reporting from the Indiana Dunes National Park, for TBH, I'm Donuel Rodriguez. Indiana is known for its miles of farmland, but what about a farm in the city? Otho Faro runs a new type of farming system inside a shipping container. The temperature, airflow, water, electricity are all controlled and you can grow, uh, you know, approximately two and a half acres of crops in the 320 square feet that we have available. Farrow grows a lot of greens, such as lettuce, kale, basil, and red mustard green. The most important thing about this, this stage is that the plants grow a root system, a very strong, reliable root system. What are the benefits for something like this? Well, in the Midwest, farmers can only farm April through October. But with this indoor vertical farm, you can grow crops all year round in a controlled environment. Farrow is not the only one interested in this new way of farming. Local schools are benefiting as well. I'm currently working with Purdue Polytechnic. Uh, that is a local high school that's about two blocks away from here. They are doing a lot of learnings around hydroponic farming. What he does is he offers us a chance to get into, see some real world industry and for our students to get a chance to actually try to solve some um, industry problems or possibly come up with solutions that he hasn't thought of before. I'm actually very grateful because I actually like hydroponics. I've been doing it for like three cycles now. While most farmers around here won't start harvesting until the summer, Farrell starts in February. I will be harvesting this week. This is the this will be the first week in February of 2022, and my crops, products will be available um, probably more so in some schools. I'm looking to do some things with um, the Montessori School here at Good Shepherd and some local chefs. For TBH, I'm Aaron Henderson. Where can you find more than 500 tasty products from handmade chocolate to crunches to coffee? The South Bend Chocolate Factory, of course. The Sweet Shop was recently voted Best Chocolate Shop in Indiana by Mental Floss. Samuel Tarner, son of owner Mark Tarner, says, While the honor helps draw in customers, he feels it's the hands-on experience that sets the company apart from other chocolatiers. As opposed to like uh, a Hershey's tour where they don't really show you how anything's made, we show you how everything is made. Um, you get to see the whole process start to finish, packaging, and you get the nice South Bend local touch. Visitors to the factory are treated to a tour that smells as good as it looks. Workers show off how they make their chocolate pretzels, nuts, popcorn crackle, and even their packaging techniques. Company started in 1991. We started making chocolates for Notre Dame. Uh, we did all of their university chocolates. We used that money to help purchase those enrobing machines that we saw in there, and uh, that's how we started making everything. While there is another candy company in South Bend, it specializes in hard candy, whereas the Tarners and their company are known for chocolate. 
Samuel says he can't remember a time where his family wasn't in the chocolate business. Or my grandfather, rather, had a candy company um, on, off of um, Hill Street. There's a building right across from St. Joe Grade School. That's where he had his original candy company. Uh, that went out of business in the early 90s, so my dad just started his own. And here we are. The chocolate recipe has served them well. There are now 15 South Bend Chocolate Company locations. Putin Bay in Ohio, that's another popular tourist location. Carmel, Indiana, we have stores there. Downtown Indianapolis, not to mention all of our stores here in town. There are plans to expand too. The Tarners are creating a tourist complex just off the highway, including a factory, candy store, gift shop, and restaurant. There will be a little something extra too, featuring a second love of Mark Tarner, a dinosaur museum. Many of the bones on display excavated by the owner himself. A uh, whole variety of dinosaurs, Diplodocus, Triceratops, um, Hadrosaurs, all types of things. And hopefully we'll have even more as time goes on, including um, active time uh, uncovering of the bones. So people will be able to watch that large skeleton you guys saw uh, be uncovered in real time. The new tourist complex is set to open in late 2023 or early 2024. For To Be Honest, I'm Jalen Baptiste Waddell. I took a trip to the Paduanmi Zoo. There were so many different animals to see, from tigers, to monkeys, to goats, or even the new pigs. But the main attraction, you can say, reached new heights. So we knew giraffes was gonna be a big game changer for this zoo. A $1.5 million donation kickstarted the Giraffe Conservation Center. And I was working with architects, we were talking to other zoos. I mean, there's so much that goes into having giraffes. You have to think about the sunlight, the, the air ventilation, um, how much space they have, all that kind of stuff, how tall the building is. There are four giraffes at this exhibit. Kellen the youngest, Wyatt, Seymour, and Maximus, who will all be turning six later this year. Our uh, Shire of the four is Seymour. Um, he kind of hangs back, but today he's been pretty brave um, coming out. But in general, he's um, been a little more shy than the others um, with aspects to training. Um, and then Max can kind of be a bit of a butt sometimes, like a teenager. And then, yeah, Kellen's pretty brave. And, yeah, they all have their unique personalities. Getting the giraffes here was the first step, but keeping them healthy and safe is a whole new process. So the dra training with giraffes is really, really important. That's why we have two zookeepers that are just dedicated to giraffes because they have things like hoof trims. You know, if you have a horse at home, it's very easy to, you know, pick up a horse's hoof and work on their hooves. A giraffe, that's going to be a lot more difficult to do. So we've got to be able to have voluntary um, participation. It, it was, we've been building like a trust with them since day one. Um, that first, you know, few few weeks of them coming in and stuff, they are very kind of timid at first um, just because everything was so new. They had new people that were working with them, a new building, a new environment. So it took a lot of time to build that trust. But yeah, now they're pretty, they're pretty friendly. Um, they'll come up and, and interact with us. This is great news for all the visitors who can't wait to get up and close with these beautiful giraffes. For TBH, I'm Isaiah Robinson. Extortion, bootlegging, and murder were common practices for Chicago's famous gangsters of the 30s and 40s. It's no wonder, then, says Christy Erickson of the South Bend History Museum, that the likes of Capone, Moran, and Dillinger were all known to frequent South Bend. Chicago was 
a uh, epicenter of gangster activity at the time and South Bend was just up the highway and so it was known to be kind of a place for gangsters to either come and visit and you know rob a bank here or there or more commonly for them to come and hide out for a little while. While most of the gangsters were from Chicago or out east, John Dillinger was born in Indianapolis. His early life wasn't the best. His mother died when he was four and his father was abusive. He dropped out of school and was arrested for car theft as a teenager before enlisting in the Navy. He deserted the Navy, so that would be kind of your first crime in uh, 1924, so he would have been 21 years old at the time. Soon after, Dillinger robbed a grocery store for a total of $50. He ended up in prison where he met seasoned criminals like Homer Van Meter, Charles Mackley, and Pete Pierpont. The Friends, which became Dillinger's first gang, studied other bank robberies, planned and strategized their own robberies while they were still in prison. After nine and a half years in prison, Dillinger was released and promptly returned to robbing banks. One of his most famous uh, acts was when he broke out of the Crown Point Jail um, by, the, as the story goes, whittling a gun out of wood and um, convincing the guards that he had a real gun and thus escaping. So that was a, a very big story. Dillinger courted the media, posing for photos and giving quotes. In return, the media portrayed him as a beloved Robin Hood type character. One of the headlines was that um, the women there were thrilled, but the men were all scared. So, you know, he was um, thought to be uh, kind of a rakish figure that, um, so people really idolized him in a way that was probably pretty inappropriate at the time. Late on a Saturday morning on the last day of June, John Dillinger and his gang robbed Merchants National Bank on Michigan Street in South Bend. Black Hudson pulled up outside of the bank and the gang got to work. While Dillinger and several other gang members went inside to hold it up, other cronies, like Babyface Nelson, stood guard. The gang took off with nearly $30,000, which would be about $640,000 in today's money. On the way out the door, they shot and killed police officer Howard Wagner. Before they could make it to the getaway car, a firefight broke out with a detective, two police officers, and a jeweler who owned a nearby shop. Bullets flew everywhere. Some are still lodged in the state theater behind me. The St. Joseph Police Department's Tommy gun, which was at the robbery, is still on display at the South Bend History Museum. Um, so Dillinger was in Chicago in 1934 after robbing the bank here. He laid low for a little while. It was, um, people believe he was injured in the bank robbery here and, and had to do some recovering. Less than three weeks later, Dillinger was gunned down outside the Biograph in Chicago by the FBI. As he came out of the theater and turned into a side alley, two FBI agents blocked the far end. Witnesses say Dillinger tried to walk back out, but saw a sniper stationed in the windows of the hotel across the street. Before he could draw his gun, he was shot four times in the back. Within minutes, the infamous gangster's body was hauled away. A crowd gathered around the pool of blood left in his wake and dipped their handkerchiefs in it to have a lasting memento of their hero. Today, there is a mural memorial to Dillinger in the alley where he died. For TBH, I'm Drew Stoltz. Do you need something to do during these sunny days? See what Elkhart County has to offer. Sonia Nash tells us sculptures built by Goshen College students will be highlighted across six cities of Elkhart County in and around the gardens. Elkhart County is home to so many wonderful creative people, whether they be students or residents. Uh, in addition, we have a 
hundreds of volunteers planning gardens in the shape of quilt patterns, taking their time to bring beauty and art to life. So we're telling the stories of our people and our places, the exciting stops that people can see along the Heritage Trail, and introducing them to all of our downtowns that are so vibrant and eclectic, filled with one of our shops, restaurants, places to stay, things to do, and really enjoy all of the things that are in our communities. Goshen College is teaming up with Quilt Gardens to bring more tourists and locals to the county. We are really, uh, really aiming to tar hope to attract um, both visitors from around the Midwest as well as our local residents to come and experience all that Elkhart County has to offer. Joel Lara is a student at Goshen College who says his art reflects personal struggle. He tells us just what opportunities he's had since coming to the United States at such a young age. I'm Hispanic. I was born in Mexico and then came to the U.S. at the age of five. I've been lucky enough to sort of be in this epic art trail and um, gain a lot of publicity. I've also had um, my work featured at different galleries around the area in Michigan and uh, in Elkhart. And so I've been lucky enough and fortunate enough to to have people who, who like my work and that's been very um, motivating. As a human being and as an artist, I've evolved over the past four years. After a year of being on display, the sculptures will be up for auction. Our website is quiltgardens.com. That's plural, quiltgardens.com. You'll find maps, you'll find detailed descriptions, not only about our gardens and our patterns, but about each artist, about each sculpture. You can find each one. And we encourage everybody to download a passport where you can check in and visit all of them and win free prizes. You're not gonna wanna miss that. The quiltgardens.com is the website where to go. For TBH, I'm Mason Cuevas. This is Pokagon State Park. One of the things that the Conservation Corps did was primarily work in public works areas, specifically such as the shelter down by Waterfront, by one of the two beaches, as well as the historic gatehouse and a few other buildings. They also planted the majority of the pine and evergreen forest that can be found here scattered across the park. The gatehouse to my right is the historic gatehouse of Pokagon State Park. It was built early on during the park's days and is used primarily as an entrance for visitors. The exterior design was such that it would give visitors just a slight taste of what the experience inside the park could hold. It had a fireplace so it could function during the winter, however it did not have a restroom. At its height, the Pokagon camp had five barracks. You can see on this map what the entire camp looked like. You can see the five barracks there. There was also a mess hall, which was relatively large, as well as the administration building. The area around the old buildings has become rather overgrown, as with the buildings down, there is no real need to keep them up. However, recently, the pegs have been put in place and some historical plaques put there, so you can get an idea of the history behind this place. Sort of get a feel for what people went through and how the state park was created. This is the old CCC well. It was used for all potable water sources as running water and plumbing had not been implemented really back then. This was the 1930s. Electricity was still relatively new, so even that was not in use at the camp. Behind me, you can see the clearing where the old recreation hall used to be. It wasn't massive, but it was big enough for a decent amount of people to enjoy themselves with different games, different activities, reading, etc. Possibly the most popular attraction at Pokagon, at least during the winter, is the toboggan run. The first run, built in 1935, only had a single track and was built for the entertainment of the members of the CCC camp. Later, in 1941, a second track was added, as well as the elevated tower that you can see here. Eventually, over the years, it was added to bit by bit, and then, obviously, during more recent times, it was amended to meet 
safety standards. It's actually a rather long track and you can reach speeds of up to 40 miles per hour. Possibly more if you're lucky. I personally have gone down it a few times and it's exceedingly fun. I would really recommend it. But as you can see, there's a steel refrigerated track that runs all the way down almost to the Potawatomi Inn by the beach. Also, there is of course the warming house which sells souvenirs as well as refreshments as well as toboggan rentals. For TBH, I'm Addison Mann. That wraps up this edition of TBH. Thanks for joining us. You can catch all our shows online at tobehonestinc.com. I'm Fernando Sanchez. And I'm Matthew Pandori-Tesley. Have a good evening and a great week.